Hmm? The boss has given me a message for you. Says there's some sort of nasty demon running around in the Aldina Plains, to the east of Logris. She thought it might be the one you're looking for. Wasn't the Eastern Highway closed off from Logris? That was only temporary. It's back open now. If you follow the road, you'll reach Stonebury Village. There you'll find one of ours who actually saw the demon. You want to know more? That'd be a good place to start. Got it. Hey, that's the same direction I sensed the... Give Tabitha our thanks. It's looking more and more like we're on the right track. We ought to go check out that Bloodwing story. Then let's start by going to Stonebury. Hey, Aizen, did I say something wrong back there? No. I just didn't think we needed to give the Bloodwings any information for free. Huh? He means the Earth Pulse points, kid. We're the only ones who know about them. But aren't we on the same side as the Bloodwings? We're not enemies with them. But I wouldn't go so far as to call them our friends, either. That's just how it goes in the underworld. Things can change at the drop of a hat. A poison hat. But how are they supposed to trust us if we don't show them trust in kind? That messenger knew our faces, even though we'd never met. He was here waiting for us, even though we hadn't told anyone where we were going. You're right! We hardly know the first thing about them, and yet they seem to know every move we make. They could easily sell us out if it struck their fancy. They'll work with us as long as we're a useful ally in their resistance against the Abbey. But the more tricks we can keep up our sleeve, the better. We've got each other's back, but only as long as we hold a knife up our sleeve. That's what counts as trust in the Underworld. That sounds terrible, but at least you can trust that Tabitha's cooking will be tasty. <laughs> Can't argue that. This is everyone's first time to Stonebury, right? Why was it blocked off? Demons? No, there was a great tornado on the Aldina Plains that swallowed up a whole merchant caravan. Hundreds gone in an instant. The cooling of the climate is causing bouts of odd weather. Thunderstorms, heavy downpours and the like. Correct. The Abbey is keeping a tight guard on traffic through the affected areas. If it's open now, that must mean the tornado is gone. I wonder what sort of place it is. It's quite lovely. In the vast forest to the east, you can find gemstones, and it's teeming with rare plants and insects. The locals trade only as much meat and hides as they need, and they live peaceful, quiet lives. You sure know a lot about this place. It's where the Norman he first fell in love with grew up. Yeah! Please don't embarrass me. Though we are apart from each other now, our hearts are still as one. Immediately after you and I made our pact and set off, she fell in love with some macho Norman and moved away. What? Why haven't I heard about this? How long have you known? Oh, I don't know. Maybe I found out during my long search for you. Or maybe it was right after we left. I remember leaving something in the village and going back to... Oh, well, not like it matters. It does matter! There's no sense in crying over a fickle girl. Come, Stonebury awaits. The Eastern Plain is finally open for travel. I hear that the people of Stonebury are alive and well. My husband and I can breathe a sigh of relief. <laughs> I wasn't worried about him at all. He talks tough, but he was really worried. Oh, sorry you don't know who we're talking about. It's his apprentice. What kind of apprentice? My husband's an architect. Even the royal family and the abbey commission his work. He's been at the docks here on a job. He just finished and we're about to return to Logris. These people don't care about all that. Why did your apprentice go to Stonebury? He's young and talented, but a bit eccentric. 
He said he wanted to help create a new town, so he set off to the frontier. A craftsman has to focus on his work. Creating a new town, ha! He should know his place. But my husband didn't disown him. That boy's fearlessness reminds me of my husband when he was young. So you understand how he feels then? I didn't say that. If he thinks he has the talent, he's free to do as he likes. But if he doesn't follow through with it to the end, I'll be done with him. Did you hear that? He thinks the boy can do it. If you ever find yourself in Stonebury, go visit that boy's workshop. <laughs> right. I'll do that. <laughs> Sorry about my husband. He can be a real grump. Don't worry about it. I'm pretty used to people like that. Hey, what's that supposed to mean? <laughs> I think I've finally gotten used to it. Used to what? Your powers. I think I've finally got a handle on them in a way that feels right. That's good. Hopefully you won't faint anymore. Yeah, and I'll keep learning too. I hope we can make this work out. Yeah, definitely. Fingers crossed. <sighs> What's wrong? Nothing. Hey! When you and Eleanor made your pact together, she gave you a true name, right? Was it a good one? Uh... True name? What's that? It's a special name in the ancient tongue given to a Moloch as a necessary step in forming a pact with a human. I gave Bienfu the name Fushikas. It means thing. <laughs> That's pretty messed up. It's just my own little way of showing affection. So what kind of name did you get, Lafayette? I... Uh... What's the matter? She didn't give you a really weird name like Mogulu gave Bienfu, did she? If you're not happy with it... I can talk to Eleanor about it later, so go on and tell me- I'm fine with it, and I can't tell you anyway. Well, you don't have to get so worked up about it. A true name is not something a Moloch just casually divulges to others. They carry a special meaning to us. Speaking it to anyone other than our Pact Keeper carries a special meaning. Between comrades, it means we trust them with our lives. In other cases, it's... Practically a confession of love! You... could have said something sooner, you know. Laffy sets at a delicate age. You should be more careful in the future. Oh, really? It's just another way of showing affection. be the demon Tabitha wanted us to know about. It's flying free, but could it still be a Therian? I just felt an Earth Pulse point. It's that way, somewhere near the top of that mountain. Let's check it out. Here! This is the Earth Pulse point I've been feeling. No Therian and no barrier. I must have gotten it wrong again. I wouldn't be so sure of that. That dragon could well have broken its barrier. Or it might have been too powerful for the Abbey to subdue. You could be right. After all, dragons make for the strongest demons. The problem is, we don't know if it's a Therian or not. Yeah. Let's stick with the plan and head to Stonebury to gather more information. only one here who thinks the real problem is how we're supposed to fight a frickin' dragon? I can't wait to take a good look around. Whoa, now that's what I call a view. I agree that it's beautiful, but don't leap about so much. You'll fall. Hmm. I can sense many earth pulses under this place. I figured you'd notice that. An intricate web of earth pulses crisscrosses the land under the Aldina Plains. Mountains like these would normally take tens of thousands of years to form, but these popped up in about a millennia. So the earth pulses have affected the land? Exactly. Long ago, people wielded arts that allowed them to manipulate the earth pulses and control the very land itself. 
How could arts like that exist? Perhaps they pushed against key points on the Earth pulses? Like how acupressure can improve a person's blood flow. That's a rather forced comparison. But you may be right. Either way, those arts have been lost for eons. I'm impressed, Aizen. You know a lot about everything. Not at all. There's so much I don't know. For example, the name of these flowers. That's why I travel. To learn. Eldina alabaster grass. That's the name of this flower? Yes. A long time ago, my brother showed me a picture of it in one of his books. They're fragile flowers. They die quickly on their own. But if enough of them gather together, they can survive. Fields of them form beautiful white carpets of flowers. In some cultures, they symbolize kinship. The bonds between people. Kinship? Huh. I'll remember that. You and your brother taught me something new today. I'll never forget either. All right. If I were a Bloodwing, where would I be? We'll start at the inn. It only makes sense. Yay! I found so many blueberries! What are you gonna do with all those? Make jam? I'm going to feed them to my chickens. That way they'll lay eggs with purple yolks. What? You know that won't work, right? It sure will. The color of yolks change depending on what a hen eats. My grandma taught me that. Hmm. Actually, we always feed our chickens corn. Is that why their yolks are yellow? What are you gonna do with purple eggs anyway? Tourists are coming from the capital again, right? I bet they've never seen purple eggs. So I figure I could sell them for a lot. <gasps> Maybe I can even make our village famous! You've thought this out, but will they really sell? You know what they'd make, right? Purple fried eggs, purple omelets, purple egg fried rice. Ugh. Hey, would you want to eat a purple omelet? S strange things sell, right? You don't have to be so mean just because you can't think of a better idea. Oh, sorry. Here, let me help you. Fine. Go catch a whole barrel full of jewel beetles. If we feed them to my chickens, we'll get eggs with yolks like shining jewels. I really wouldn't want to be your chickens, but... Okay. What a carefree village. But you know, this is what really makes humanity amazing to me. Attempting the impossible. Reaching for the stars, just as a matter of course. Aye. Though we may stumble countless times on our way, we can achieve anything we put our minds to. Attempting the impossible, huh? That's all well and good, but there are some lines that should never be crossed. Purple eggs. Blech. Raspberries, strawberries, blueberries. They all grow in abundance around Stonebury. We even have a fairy tale about it. One day the ground was covered with so many fallen berries, they all became stones. Stoneberries? Is that how the town got its name? The spelling has changed some, but yes. Berries are an important part of this village. We harvest local berries to make jams, pastries, gels, and all sorts of sweets. Berry-flavored gels! I've never had one. We've exported our jam and fruit for a while now, but our raspberry gels are still being perfected. Aw, rats. Are the vegetables growing in that field special too? I don't think I've ever seen anything like them before. You've got sharp eyes. But that's right. They're a rare species of wild potato. They're red and they're called radish bells. We discovered them in the mountains nearby. Sadly, the potatoes are actually highly poisonous. Really? They look so good. They do, but the skin and the sprouts are toxic. If you aren't careful when removing them, it's Poisonville for you. Deadly poison aside, they're sweet, fluffy, and go great with butter. And when they're fried nice and crispy, they're the best. So just skin them and sell them. What's the problem? Yes, we've thought of that, but the way they are now, you have to peel off quite a bit before you get to the edible part. Peel one as big as your fist, and all you get for your trouble is a bit of meat the size of an egg yolk. That's why we're selectively breeding them. One day, they'll have only a thin layer of poisonous skin. Why not breed them to get rid of the poison altogether? With no poison, bugs will eat them. 
and they'll be more vulnerable to cold and heat. With potatoes, as with people, getting rid of everything harmful isn't always for the best. The water around here is ideal for producing wine and spirits. I've been thinking about fermenting something new. What will you make? This region's specialty is berries, so a berry wine? Hmm. But the chilly air and level of humidity here should be just right for making an amber draft, don't you think? Considering the geography around here, the water must contain a high mineral content. If you use it to make a rice wine, the taste will be unique. I've considered all those options, but I must create something that can surpass my greatest rival, Sleeping Princess. But that's nearly impossible to make. <laughs> exactly. Not an easy task, to say the least. Sleeping Princess is made by filling an emerald cask with water from an enchanted mountain spring and sitting it in direct sunlight for seven years. The water's magic causes it to change color each year. When it reaches the same deep green hue of the cask, it's ready. Solar fermenting, huh? It won't be easy to surpass a marvel of the winemaking world like Sleeping Princess. True, but I've finally found it. The ultimate stone. A gemstone? Will you make a cask from it? That would just make it an imitation. No. What I found can only be called a natural rock filter. You're filtering wine with a rock? Deep in the heart of these mountains, I found a stone that absorbs liquids. I tried using it to filter a berry wine. The taste of it was unbelievably crisp and bright. It preserved the luscious richness of the berries while adding a clarity that left me breathless. I call it pure land wine. There is no better. May I have a taste? Uh, my apologies, but it took me ten years to make a single thimbleful. I drank that thimbleful for my tasting. It'll be about fifty years before I can make a decent batch. I doubt I'll see a full bottle in my lifetime. Fifty years, huh? Meet you back here, then? I've never been so glad not to be human. You need sundries. We got sundries. Stoneberry hasn't had much luck growing just yet, but this pioneer town has a lot of potential. Trees grow well here, and the lumber is of great quality. Oh, we're also close to the quarries, so stone isn't a problem. As long as the demons are contained, this country will rebuild. The need for stone and lumber will soar. Best of all, this area is quiet, has beautiful lakes, and is a perfect place for a craftsman like me to work. And why settle for anything less? I do feel that you might be a bit short-handed here. It's hard to build without manpower. You're right. We need something to attract new settlers. Maybe some sort of specialty item? Is there any fruit or vegetable that can only be found around here? There is a type of potato called the radish bell that we grow, but it's got a few, uh, <laughs> quirks. If you want to attract people, you should just ring a bell. Come to Stonebury, where the money grows on trees. Hmm. A bell tower, huh? That might actually work. We can even use local stones for the bell. The Stonebury Stone Belfry. It won't work. Huh? Try hitting a rock. Doesn't ring. Ah, oh, how could I have missed that? I'm still such a novice. My master taught me better than this. Think before you build. That's what he always said. I need to do better and not sully his name. I was on my way home from a trip to Logres, crossing the Aldina Plains, when I saw it. Rain was pouring as if from buckets, and the wind was so strong I could hardly stay on my feet. From the vast darkness of the sky, a monster of tremendous size descended, like the essence of the storm itself. A huge flying demon? At that moment, a group of exorcists leapt out from their hiding spots and began to battle the demon beast. But it met their swords with its fearsome horns, and a swipe of its tail threw the noble exorcist back. Horns? And a tail? Where did the demon go? I couldn't tell you. I was so frightened, I ran away and never looked back. I hope the Abbey can get rid of it, but the beast took out three exorcists with a single blow. Come to think of it, 
Another person was there too. He faced the demon and told it to stop. Savid. If you're going to the Aldina Plains, you'd better be careful. Savid. Well, hello, sailor. Are you waiting for someone? Nope. Just saying a prayer for someone. Someone? Let's go. Clearly there aren't any blood wings here. You're just going to leave? I'm right here! Everybody has times they need to be alone. Fee. Right. Coming. What do you think he was praying about? Well, for one thing, he was drinking a bottle of Thorny Forest. Oh my! The drink you share with your special someone when you're going to be married for life! How romantic! But getting your hands on that stuff is no small feat. I can only hope I'll get a chance to taste it someday. That must have had an important meaning for Savid. That's why you left him alone. Don't read too much into it. You're Velvet, right? Huh, you must be the one who's seen the demon we're after. We saw a big snake-looking dragon fly over on the way here. Is that what you saw, too? Yes, that's the one. It nests at the top of the mountain in Aldina Plains. We went to look ourselves. No dragon. It only returns to its nest on rainy days. Rainy days, you say? Oh, Just look at what you went and made the weather gods do! This doesn't bode well. Not at all! Thanks. We'll give it another shot. Hey there! Our meeting like this must be Providence Meow! We're in a hurry. Save it, cats. All the better, Meow. I've just stumbled upon a perfectly nifty piece of stone just for you. What's it for? <gasps> That's not a geoboard, is it? Bingo! I dug it out of some ruins, Meow. They were made by Norman Meowney years ago for surfing along Earth pulses, but I can't use it, so I figured I'd pawn it off on someone else who could, Meow. Wait, Norman made this? That doesn't exactly inspire confidence. Don't be so mean! We're capable of exceptional things! And sometimes, when a Norman speaks their own name, the board springs to life! and whisks its masters away at top speed. They'll even plow right through weak demons. You can say it's our masterwork, even if we sort of stumbled on it by accident. Huh. Well, then I apologize. So we can ride this as long as we have Bianfu with us, right? Well, kind of. Do you have to use your true name to activate it? Not my true name, no. My Norman name. Wouldn't that just be Bienfu? No. Norman have a separate name that goes something like Norman so-and-so. It's almost more a title than a name. Often the name has something to do with what they're good at. Something like Attack, or Chain, or Aqua. Right. You could say names like Bienfu and Grimoire are more like stage names. I actually don't know Bienfu's Norman name, but I can't wait to find out. What is your name, Bienfu? Uh, Come on out with it. We're in a hurry. Norman Brave. Whoa, look at that! Wait, Bienfu. <laughs> your Norman name is Brave? <laughs> that is so deliciously absurd! Oh, 
Why do you think I've never told you before, Herbie? <laughs> At least the board works now. And if we get on this board, it'll move us around? Well, about that. The board propels itself by pushing against Earth pulse flows. To do that, the board needs information on the flows. But this one here's a completely blank slate, Meow. First, you need to find the geo trees in each area. They serve as a conduit between the surface land and the Earth pulses, Meow. Once you've actually located a geo tree, you can record that area's Earth pulse data into your geo board, Meow. Got it. This area's geo tree is right over there, Meow. All right then. So long as we find more geo trees, we'll be able to use the geo board to travel much more quickly. Well, that's going to come in handy. Yeah, and it's a lot of fun to ride, too. I could get used to this. <sighs> I'm so worn out. I feel like I had to sprint the whole way here. Huh. It seems like operating the board saps a lot of energy from Bienfu. Even still, this board gives us a strategic advantage. Brave here will just have to bear a little exertion now and then. Yeah, Brave. Buck up. I believe in you. Be brave. Ah! Stop calling me that! It looks so deadly. And just check out how much malevolence it's putting out. Which means it's not a Therian. Let's retreat. We've got no reason to pick a fight with something we can't handle. I do. Oh, you're up for it? What? What are you doing? She's right. Fighting this creature is a good way to end up dead. Oh, uh, sorry. Well, no turning back now. Damn it, this wasn't part of the plan. Yeah, a training like this doesn't come around every day. Be on your guard. One wrong move and you're done for. I know, that's the fun part. <laughs> This one definitely puts up a better fight than your average demon. Is there any hope of actually defeating this thing? I'll do whatever it takes. That's my way. Sabine! Yeah. I see you're out for blood, as usual. You knew, didn't you, Isaac? Out of my way. What? 
What? Are you protecting the dragon? She's not a dragon! Huh? Back off, or I'll make you back off. <laughs> Got away. <sighs> that hurts, babe. And here we hadn't seen each other in so long. Hold it. Is that dragon someone you knew? I told you, she's not a dragon. Check out my pecs, and the dragon have some kind of close ties. Did I hear you right? We're talking about a dragon here. I know what I said. But how could that be? When Malakim are tainted by malevolence, a dragon is what ultimately results. So you're saying that dragon was a Malak Zavid once now? She must be who he was praying for back in town. Yeah, most likely. But do Malakim put out malevolence like humans do? No. Not by themselves, they don't. But if one remains in contact with humans or demons who do, it will eventually taint her, and she will become a dragon. What about you, kiddo? You feel anything weird after you got thrown into the Earth Pulse at the Empyrean's throne? I did, yeah. Can't say I'm surprised. The air there was thick with malevolence being sent on its way to Enominat. If I'd stayed there, I might be a dragon, too. Is having a vessel not enough to prevent a Moloch from transforming? A vessel can reduce the effect, but not eliminate it. By stripping their Molochim of consciousness, the Abbey Exorcists seem to be able to inhibit the transformation. But nothing in this world is guaranteed. Can a dragon ever be changed back into a Moloch? Nope. Just like with demons, there's no going back. Do they still hold on to some part of who they were? You saw that dragon. What do you think? Well, that's... But Zavid still won't kill it. Must be his creed at work. Aizen, listen. Whatever business you and Zavid have with that dragon, I don't care. Do what you have to. But I won't tolerate you getting the rest of us involved in it again. Do I make myself clear? You've got it. Good. Now, let's get back to the Therian hunt. We'll regroup in Titania. If what Aizen said is true, then could I wind up as a dragon someday? Or Aizen too? I don't... I don't know. Titles, titles, keeping tight circles. Oh, perfect timing, Aizen. I's got a letter for you. A letter? Did you get a reply to that letter you sent? What's it say? What's it say? I know everything that you've done. Repent for your horrendous deeds, you monster. What did you do, Aizen? No idea. There's no sender written on here either. Who would write something so awful? Who cares? If I gave a damn about other people's feelings, I wouldn't be a pirate. I suppose that's true. Forget about it. What's the status of the other stuff? The Palmier made it just fine. But uh, we've run into some troubles finding the Nordals. My deepest apologies. What are Nordals? Nordals used to be given out by Empyrean temples. If you collect a set of four, you find happiness. Oh, so they said. Nowadays, there's only four left. Red, blue, green, and black. Even worse, nobody hardly knows nothing about them. Dolls of the Empyreans? Do you think they're like that one we saw of Aminoch in that shop in Isolt? Kind of, but these are less gloomy looking and more, uh, hmm, how can I describe it? Something like a quiet radiance? A quiet radiance? <laughs> That's perfect! I think I get it. I'd never have pegged you as a collector of religious claptrap, Aizen. Think they'll help keep the Reaper away? Probably not. But in the off chance they actually work, they'll keep her safe. Her? 
Hey, that letter Aizen sent off earlier was addressed to a woman, wasn't it? <laughs> Our little Luffy said is growing up. N no I wasn't implying she was his girlfriend. Her writing just seemed more mature, and... It's nothing like that. She's my younger sister. I didn't know you had a sister. She's the only family I have left. She and I live apart for various reasons. I'm guessing your death curse is one of them, huh? Mogilu! Hmm. So that's why. I'd be happy to help you look for those dolls, Aizen. Are you sure? Yeah. Okay, then. Thanks. I saw Benwick and the other crew members get into a serious fight over whether cats or dogs were better. I don't get what the big deal is. I can't believe you could say such a thing! No conflict is more perilous than the one that has dogged mankind since the dawn of civilization! In the shadow of every war are the battles of dog lovers and cat lovers. Between each side lies a divide, maybe not all that deep, but unbridgeable all the same. I'd say we're lucky that the squabble you saw didn't escalate into anything more serious. I had no idea it was such a big deal. So what side do all of you fall on? I am, without a doubt, a cat person. Cats and witches have a long history together. Personally, I prefer dogs because they can cohabit with humans while following rules. But I like cats too, because they're cute. What about you, Rokuro? Shigure liked cats, so I don't. But I like dogs even less. Always wagging their tails for their masters. <laughs> I feel the same way. Dogs will trade anything for food. Learning tricks, wagging their tails, getting friendly. And in time, even forgetting to howl. I think that's too cynical. Dogs make efforts to please humans so that we can live together. They're friendly and compassionate creatures. Then does that make you a cat person, Aizen? Actually, I like squirrels best. When I lived with my sister, the nearby forest had lots of nice, fluffy squirrels that would let me pet them. This isn't about squirrels. It's about cats and dogs. You have to pick a side. If I had to choose, yeah, it'd be cats. There's something lovable about the way they act, especially when you spoil them. It reminds me a lot of my sister. What about you, Velvet? Cats or dogs? Dogs. They don't betray you. You always have to be so serious, don't you? So Velvet and Eleanor like dogs, while Mogilu and Aizen prefer cats. And Rokuro doesn't care for either one. That makes you our tiebreaker, kiddo. The fate of this showdown is in your hands. It is? Now that you're no longer the Abbey's dog, perhaps you're thinking of being one for Velvet's column? What has that got to do with anything? We're just talking about which animal we like. If you're getting so angry over this, he's going to have no choice but to pick dogs. I just told you... No more fighting! This is clearly getting out of hand, so why don't you all agree that you're Bienfu people and make up already? And what makes you special enough to have Bienfu people? Because I can be loyal like a dog, but also do my own thing like a cat. If you pick me, everybody wins. I don't think it works that way. I guess a dragon was a bit much to take on, even for the Reaper. You should get some rest. We all should. I'll just get the crew started on readying the ship for our next departure. All right, you go do that. Luffy said, you should get some rest too. I'm fine. It's more important that I focus on finding an actual Therian this time. I'm going to take another try at sensing the Earth Pulse points. <sighs> <sighs> You're as stubborn as ever, Fee. Hey, Kuragane! Let me ask you something. More complaining, is it? Come on, don't be like that. Every time I turn around, Velvet or one of the pirates is telling me to go make some delivery to some island. I can never get a break. Isn't that just a sign they think you're a dependable guy? Maybe, but I don't see them sending you off on errands. It's like they take one look at your face and decide to leave you alone. I don't have a face. Oh, right. Sorry. Slip of the tongue. 
Maybe you just don't know how much work I do around here. It's more than you think. Anything to do with iron, I do it. Making tools, repairing things. What do you take me for? Some kind of cheeky freeloader? I don't even have cheeks. <laughs> You're too funny! But doesn't it ever annoy you to have all these kids giving you orders? I've spent my entire life thinking of nothing but forging swords. It's been centuries since I've interacted with youngsters like them. They can be a hassle. But at least, it's a new hassle. Yeah, that's what I thought at first. So I went along with whatever they asked. But I've been too nice, so they keep pushing work onto me. Maybe if I hadn't been so helpful, they would have stayed out of my face like they stay out of yours. I don't have a face. That's not the point. Aren't you even listening to what I'm saying here? You need to make up your mind. You and I got on this ship alongside these people, who are putting themselves in great danger in order to live the lives of their choosing. If you don't like it, then go on and get off this ship with your tail between your legs. Yeah, except I don't have a tail right now. Don't push yourself too hard now, Lafayette. said. You hear me? I hear you. I just... I told everyone I could find the Therians, but... I've only sent us to the wrong places. Aizen, is there any way to boost Amalok's powers? <sighs> I guess it's okay for me to tell you this. The majority of Malakim today have their consciousnesses sealed away to be used as mere tools for the exorcists. But originally, Malakim were beings who received prayers from people and in return bestowed their blessings upon nature and mankind. So you're saying that when humans pray to Amalok, the Moloch receives great strength? Yes. In general, at least. Some Malachim, like me, buck the system and bring about misfortune rather than divine grace. Oh, that's unfortunate. But who would ever pray to me? Maybe you didn't lead us to any Therians, Fee, but it's not like we came back empty-handed. We found Ori Kalkum to use against Shigure. And we also learned we can hold our own against a dragon. Velvet. So where should we go next, Fee? Northgand. There's a big earth pulse point north of Helavis. Works for me. Aizen? We can leave whenever you want. Doesn't matter to me. And I'm all set. Let's make our way to the harbor. When I say prayers, I don't mean outright worshipping. All I'm talking about are earnest thoughts and feelings directed at you. I see. So I'm already receiving prayers then. Our next target is north of Helavis, near the Faldi's ruins. In light of everything we know, I'd say it's highly likely we'll find a Therian there. Let's hope! Then we should make our first stop, Port Helavis. With the, uh, mischief we got into last time, Getting into the city might prove difficult. Benwick, how are things in Helavis right now? That shipping guild that used to handle our mooring is pretty much toast. But for some reason, the Abbey isn't watching the port as much as they once were. Unfamiliar ships have been hauling in relief supplies, so if we pose as one of the transport ships, I think we can slip in. And if we divert some supplies to an unofficial channel, we might be able to secure a new mooring partner. Smuggling in relief supplies for our own disaster. Cheeky bastards, aren't we? It's what'll get us in. That much is true. It's a plan. Roger. I'll get right on it. Hey, Eleanor. Abbey exorcists don't pray to their tethered Malachim, do they? You mean something besides our oaths? An oath is a magical formula that grants you power in exchange for binding you to a rule, right? Yes, though that is simplifying it a bit. When Malachim receive human prayers, they bestow their blessings upon people in nature. Aizen told me that we Malachim grow stronger when humans pray to us. Prayers and blessings? I've never heard of that. I used to think the same way as the other exorcists. Malachim are merely tools that allow us the use of arts. Yeah, that's what I figured. But Inomi not is different. 
The exorcists all worship him. They have faith in his mighty power. And not only that, the people of this nation pray to the Empyrean for salvation, just as Artorius instructs them. Ah, I get it now. See the wheels turning, do you, kiddo? Huh? Artorius founded the Abbey within the existing Church of the Empyreans, so that he could direct the people's thoughts towards Enominat, so that even while they lionize Artorius as their savior, they are made aware of Enominat's presence behind him. Everyone starts believing in Enominat. The prayers of the entire world go to him, becoming his power. After the centuries-long decline of Empyrean worship, he becomes stronger than anyone today could imagine. The pieces do fit. Oaths, prayers, blessings, the demon blight. So much in this world is affected by matters of the heart. They hold magical power, both effective and meddlesome. We are truly going up against the rest of the entire world, aren't we? Don't look so troubled, Eleanor. I'm gonna do my best to get stronger, so believe in me. I am a Moloch, after all. Oh, Lafie said. You've become so brave so quickly. Have I? But you're still cute when you get embarrassed. Hey, why is your face so red? Huh? My face isn't red. Huh? Hmm. Hey, Aizen. What's it feel like to get a letter? I don't feel anything, nor do I want or need to. There's no joy in receiving these things. Huh? Why not? <laughs> Don't be so shocked. Look, it's just an invoice from the Turtles. What's the big deal anyway? Do you wish you'd get letters too? Yeah. But I don't have anyone to send letters to. Let alone anyone who would send me any. Luffy said, I've got a letter for you. What? Really? Who could it be from? The sender is... Bienfu? Yep, yep! You got a letter from yours truly! I figured you'd be wanting someone to send you a letter right about now, so I wrote one up for you. What do you think? You're happy, right? Oh, uh, yeah. Thanks, Bianfu. I'll even read it for you. <clears throat> Dear Moloch Laffy Set, I hope that this letter finds you in good health and high spirits. Thankfully, I'm doing well myself. No major changes to report. Bienfu's taking all this so seriously. It's so rare to actually see him like this. As you're aware, I've been spending my days ironing Magilu's outfits, sewing her buttons, and washing her hat and tremendously long socks. Recently, however, I made the mistake of remarking to her that she might not have been quite as slender as she once was in her younger years. She hung me upside down from the roof in the middle of the cold! I nearly became a frozen Normansicle! It was so horrible that I couldn't stop my tears from flowing down my little cheeks! Bien! <laughs> ah, uh, there's the Bienfu we know and love. But all you wrote about in that letter was yourself. And you even read it out loud yourself. That's okay. Thanks, Bienfu. It feels nice to get a letter. That's so kind of you to say. I think I might cry again. <laughs> We've loaded everything bound for Helavis. With that much trade, I doubt anyone will suspect us. Any idea who can give us cover for docking? Not anyone in particular, but recently the power and influence of the Helavis Fisherman's Guild has caught my eye. The Fisherman's Guild, huh? Let's bring them some extra relief supplies. Fuel, drink, and as for the drink... Twelve-year-old Amber Draft. The sailors of Elevis have an eye for the stuff. You heard that from Dial, I take it. He's got a sharp eye. He took a bottle in payments, but I say we turn a blind eye to it. We thought we were the best at this kind of thing, but having him around has been a real eye-opener. Okay, but tell him if he takes a second, he'll pay for it. Eye for an eye. Aye, aye. I'll keep an eye on him so that he doesn't sneak off with another bottle. The supplies are loaded. 
We can make for Helavis whenever you want. That was fast. If we weren't hard workers, we wouldn't be sailors. <laughs> Eleanor! <laughs> oh, what's wrong, Kamoana? She, uh, she said she had a dream about her mom. When mommy saw me, she said I looked scary. That she didn't want a scary little girl like me. <laughs> Your mother would never say that, sweetheart. But how can you be sure? Well, uh, how do I put it? I know because I know. You're just lying to make me feel better. <laughs> Aw, Kamawana, don't cry. I... <laughs> This is the part I hate about little kids. I'm not a little kid! I hate you, Velvet! I hate That's you! That's right. Let it all out. Stop it! Stop it! Mommy! I saw my mommy! She didn't want me! <laughs> She managed to cry herself to sleep. They're not rational creatures. Sometimes you just gotta let them cry it out. You seem used to it. I guess you could say that. Luffy usually kept himself together when he was younger. But when he was really little, he had times like this every now and then. Uh. And on that note, let's take off all we can. My liege. Dial, I leave Kamoana in your care. I'll do what I can, but kids as sweet and honest as her are harder to deal with than corrupt bureaucrats. An outlaw prince and a talking lizard are no replacement for a mother. I do hope Kamalana isn't crying anymore. Yeah. Shush. How long is it going to be before you send in another exorcist to replace Lady Teresa? With these demons clamoring at our gates, none of us feel safe anymore. You have our deepest sympathies, but we were sent here on a different mission. That's what the last exorcist who came here said before leaving for the north. What could be up there that's worth all that attention? Surely we're not all being punished by the Abbey for what happened with Medissa, are we? That is not the case. Now, if you'll excuse us, we have business to attend to. So the exorcists are just passing through town and heading straight north. Odd. <sighs> Ever since the Calamity showed up, everything's just gone to pot, I say. Calamity? What do you mean? I mean the demon who barged in and made a mess of our fair city. She's a nasty creature of pure evil, with an arm that eats anything that gets in her way. Haven't you heard of her? The Calamity's been rampaging across the whole kingdom, not just here. Scant few have seen her and survived. Huh. You don't say. After the Calamity raised our ships and our port, the shipping guild fell apart, and our trade routes got poached by other ports. It's bad. The town relies on trade to make ends meet. People are abandoning the city, and our streets are no longer safe. Not to mention the demon blight spreading again. Just the other day, a little kid turned into a demon. Just like that. What a world. What a world. 
What have the exorcists been doing during all of this? Well, Lady Teresa was in charge of this region, but she came up short against the Calamity and got a fat demotion for her troubles. Several new exorcists have been reassigned here, but once they arrive, they all traipse right off to the ruins up north. This has to be Medissa's fault. If she hadn't gone and done something so stupid... Medissa... That's enough. This isn't something for outsiders to know. You're right. Sorry. <sighs> I'm really worried about what's going to come of this town. It sounds like Helavis isn't what it used to be these days. We need to ask around and find out more about what's going on here. Agreed. Especially regarding the Abbey and those ruins. I'm also curious about this Medissa woman. The ruins part makes sense, since the Earth Pulse Point might be there. But why do you care who Medissa is? Just a hunch. Something tells me she's worth looking into. You're not gonna look into this calamity chick? She sounds like a real terror. Yeah, I think I'll pass. I already know plenty about what makes her tick. Are you alright, Madam Eleanor? Don't let those people get you down. I'm fine. Thank you for your concern. Uh, but could you not do that thing where you blow air on me to dry my tears? Alright, I'll just pat your head then. That won't be necessary either. But really, things are in a terrible state. The town burned, the guild ruined, the abbey all but gone. It won't be a functioning port for some time. You can't fault them for being upset. They had it real good here until we came along. Those Helavisians were like spoiled children. How so? Helavis was once a tiny fishing village. The bountiful northern seas provided plenty enough fish to sustain their trade. But Flamestone gave them an easy way to get rich. And once they got a taste, they abandoned their old craft. And now they're paying the price. But I've heard that the cooling temperature has covered half the Northern Sea in ice drift, making fishing much more difficult. Uh, but the drifting ice carries tiny organisms, enriching the waters where it melts. The fish should be more plentiful than ever. I suppose you may have a point. We're ones to talk after what we did, but taking the easy path, then complaining as soon as it gets hard, that seems... Spoiled, yes. You said it, Luffy said. I think my appetite's getting a little overindulgent, too. <laughs> That's not a bad thing. Just means you're healthy. Giant squid come to these waters in this season. Should I ask Benwick to fish some up? Yeah, and some normal octopuses, too. <laughs> this calamity is... us, isn't it? Well... We've been waging war with the Abbey everywhere we go, and now we're about to take it to a new level. If we pull the next Therian off of the Earth Pulse point, it'll likely be Kamoana's village all over again. The same devastation? Ooh! I wonder if there's something worse than Calamity that they can call us! This is no laughing matter. People turn into demons in part due to their own malevolence. It's not like they're entirely innocent. But if there's someone out there who's being forced to act as Inominat's mouth, like Kamawana was, isn't saving them the right thing to do? I cannot argue with that, but... You don't have to worry. I'm the one who will devour the barrier. And I'm the one who will do what needs to be done. <laughs>